so welcome everyone and thank you for joining this session uh, titled uh, um, uh, model validation and calibration and parameter estimation so i'm gabriele standardi i'm a researcher at the uh, euro mediterranean center on, on climate change and um, um, Zeynep uh, will be the, 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 the session host from the Center for, for the Global Trade Analysis. And um, so before getting to the presentations, uh, please uh, um, allow me to remind the, the basic rules. So all attendees except the person who is speaking must remain muted. And uh, uh, all the speakers have 20 minutes for the for the presentations. So the session host will verbally prompt the presenter when there are two minutes remaining in their allotted time. And then uh, the discussion periods will last uh, 10 minutes. Uh, listeners must enter their question comment uh, to in the chat board, uh, and I will collect the questions and read the question, or as you prefer, you can read also the question. And um, so uh, I think that, uh, yes, following all but the final presentation, there will be a two minutes transition period to allow the next presenter time to load, uh, share uh, their presentation. So now I think we can start uh, uh, with the first, uh, with the first uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, David uh, uh, Stepanian from the Johan Heinrich von Thunen Federal Research Institute for rural areas, forestry and fisheries in Germany. And he will present uh, a work uh, titled Stochastic Simulation with Informed Rotation of Gaussian uh, Quadratures. So, uh, David, uh, the floor is yours uh, and you can, uh, you can start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, my name is David Stefanian. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Tunen Institute of Farm Economics in Germany. But uh, the paper I'm going to present today is a part of my PhD dissertation, which I have completed uh, at Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and this title is Stochastic Simulation with Informed Rotations of Gaussian Quadratures. Okay, so the recent increase in computational power and speed has led our simulation models expanding in detail and complexity, which itself has led uh, uh, to increased uncertainty surrounding our model results. And therefore, the so-called uncertainty analysis or systematic sensitivity analysis has become a good or uh, standard modeling practice for many of us. Now, uh, now let's look at uh, what really uh, an uncertainty analysis is about. So imagine we have a model variable or parameter called X. This can be yields, prices, elasticities, whatever you, you wish. And we also have a probability distribution describing the uncertainty around this variable with this parameter X called JX. In this case, for example, we have a normal distribution. And we have a model function fx, which can be supply, price, demand, or whatever, for which we want to find the expected value given this uncertainty surrounding our x. To do so, we end up with an integration problem like this. And uh, since uh, such integration problems do not have an analytical solution, they need to be approximated numerically. And to this end, what one can do is to select n xk points from this probability distribution with their associated weights and solve the expression one using a, uh, a finite sum presented in expression two. So usually these xk points are selected in such a way that the expression two means the same result as the expression one. This problem can easily be extended to multivariate cases. Now the problem is how to select those xk points in order to end up with an accurate solution. There are many different methods of doing so. However, Haber categorizes those methods into two very broad groups called probabilistic methods and efficient methods. The probabilistic methods include the very well-known Monte Carlo method. This is a simple method and the basic logic behind it is to select these xk points randomly. 
Therefore, according to the law of large numbers, the larger our sample size selected from the probability distribution, the more accurate our results will be. However, Haber also shows that in order to obtain an error, approximation error below 1%, uh, uh, this sample size needs to range from 40,000 to 100,000. Now imagine solving one of our models 40,000 times or 100,000 times, this is not real. Yeah. In order to decrease this sample size requirement and to increase the rate of convergence, usually some kind of stratified sampling is combined with the uh, pure random Monte Carlo sampling. This means dividing this probability space of this distribution into several intervals and selecting several points from each interval. There is also another well-known method called Latin hypergroup sampling, and this is uh, recently the most, most uh, often used method. And uh, this can be viewed as a compromise solution between pure random Monte Carlo sampling and stratified sampling, because this divides the probability space into equally distanced intervals and selects one point randomly from each interval. However, when conducting uh, an uncertainty analysis uh, using these probabilistic methods, it is crucial to keep in mind that uh, uh, there is also one additional step required, which is the convergence evaluations because there is no sample size that fits all the models. And to understand what is the required sample size, we need to do some convergence evaluations or some experiments. However, many researchers usually skip this and accept the sample size that fits their computational capacities, assuming that this will yield accurate results, which often is not the case. The efficient methods include the well-known Gauss quadrature methods. In this study, we are referring to the free Gauss quadrature formula by Stroud, whose theorem states that in order <coughs> uh, to obtain uh, equal, uh, in order to obtain the uh, equally weighted numerical integration formula of degree three, uh, in which we can only use two endpoints, a necessary and sufficient condition is that these two endpoints or these Gauss quadrature points or these selected points, these xk's, and in this case, as you see, we only have two n because n is our dimensionality, and if we have three-dimensional problem, we can solve this three-dimensional problem only using six points. In this case, we have these black dots as our X case. So in order to solve the problem only using two endpoints, the sufficient and necessary conditions are that these two endpoints form an, uh, are the vertices of a, general, a generalized uh, n octahedron whose centroid coincides with the centroid of the integration region, in this case of a cube, and that these points lie inside the cube. However, Stroud was confronted with the problem that whenever the dimensionality of the problem was greater than three, if we, if we had more than three stochastic variables in the model, these, these points were fall, falling outside the integration region and thus they were producing unusable formula. Therefore, he proposed the following formula to rotate this octahedron inside the cube and bring these Gauss quadrature points back inside the integration region. This was a very smart idea, and Channing Arndt uh, in 1996 uh, adapted Stroud's formula for integrals with multivariate standard normal distribution as weight function, and therefore he adjusted this formula. And in order to obtain the final Gauss quadratures that we can use in our models, we just need to, uh, to have a square matrix A, which can be obtained from our from the covariance matrix of our uh, stochastic variables or parameters using any linear transformation method. And then we need the gamma matrix, which will be obtained by those formulae, and uh, the mu vector, which can be viewed as the vector of our base values of the parameters from the model. So a bit about the current state of art. So as I already said, Chen Gang was the pioneering study who introduced this efficient uh, method of, of uh, stochastic analysis into an uh, economic simulation model, into the GTAP model. And the efficiency of this method was just outstanding because it solved the problem only using two endpoints. 
Later, several studies examined the quality of the results obtained by this method. For example, Preckel et al. analyzed whether the impact of limited sampling interval of this method, uh, 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 whether this, uh, the limited sampling interval of this method has an impact on the quality of the results, and they found out that the sampling breadth is important for highly nonlinear models. And on the top of this, they proposed a method uh, that um, uh, extends the, the sampling interval of uh, these Gauss quadratures by a desired factor. In another study, Preck and Agile examined whether using different linear transformation methods to obtain that square matrix A from the covariance matrix has an impact on the quality of the results, but they found out that this is not a crucial uh, aspect for the quality of the results. Later, Marco Artavia uh, asked the question whether the initial position from which we start rotating this octahedron impacts the quality of the results. And surprisingly, he found that yes, they do. This was a very controversial finding because up to this point, the opposite opinion was prevailing. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, at this point, everyone using this method was a bit lost. They didn't know how to proceed. And moreover, later, Villori and Preckel examined the quality of the results of the Gauss quadrature methods by comparing the results obtained by this method from the GTAP model with the results obtained with the Monte Carlo methods. And they discovered large differences in the first three moments of the probability distributions of the results. And they went as far as suggesting not to stop, uh, to stop using this Gauss quadrature method and to accept the computational uh, costs of proper uh, imposed by these probabilistic methods. Well, at this stage, it was a bit unclear how to move forward because they found these problems with the Gauss quadrature method and did not propose any uh, alternative method of uh, overcoming these problems or or reducing uh, the approximation error. That's why in uh, in another study, we uh, we said, okay, if we don't know which rotations of this octahedron produce Gauss quadratures that yield good quality results. Let's randomly rotate this Gauss quadratures, this octahedron 10 times, 20 times, solve the model with these 10 or 20 Gauss quadrature families, and take the average of the results. And this probably will improve the results. We did this in three different simulation models and found that this indeed reduces the approximation error by a factor of nine. So this was a paper that we uh, uh, presented at the GTAP conference in 2019, and later it became a publication, and we named this method MRGQ method, multiple rotations of Gauss quadratures. And when uh, uh, doing this, uh, working on this paper, we observed an interesting pattern, uh, which was that, then uh, that certain Gauss quadratures were producing obviously very good quality results for all the model variables, and some were producing obviously very bad quality results, and the rest were somewhere in the middle. So our, our problem was to find what was causing this. So uh, and then we came, uh, we uh, found this pa a nice paper by Campolunga, who tried to improve the elementary effects method by maximizing the dispersion of the sampling points in the input space. So we decided to take this method and apply it to the Gauss quadratures, meaning that we decided to select the Gauss quadrature families in which the points are spread out the most. So this is also logical. Right? If the points are spread out the most in the parameter space, that means they are able to capture the parameter space much better than if they are scattered together. To do so, we introduced a new term in terminology, which was the dispersion of the Gauss quadrature family. And this was the minimum distance between any two points of Gauss, uh, uh, of any, uh, in, within the Gauss quadrature family. And then by maximizing this dispersion, we were ending up with the Gauss quadratures uh, in which uh, the points were scattered out, uh, were, were spread out the most. Now I suggest looking at this graphically. Here we have three different families of Gauss quadratures. Uh, uh, those black dots are the are our Gauss quadratures, and the dotted lines are the minimum distance between any two Gauss quadratures. 
But as you can see, according to our logic, the Gauss quadrature depicted in figure C are supposed to produce much better quality results than the ones in figure A and figure B. Similarly, in a three-dimensional space, uh, the Gauss quadratures depicted in figure B here are supposed to produce, again, better quality results than the ones in figure A, because they are spread out much further. So we decided to test uh, this hypothesis in three different simulation models. First, since this study started uh, with the finding of Marco Artavia, then we decided to take his simulation model and the same data he used, which was the ESIM model, which is a partial equilibrium global model. Then we also, in order not to depend on one simulation, one particular data framework, we also tested it in the global model, which is a partial equilibrium bottom-up recursive dynamic model with global coverage. And uh, by, we, uh, we also tested it in uh, the recursive dynamic version of the IFPRI model, which is a single, a single country model and is adjusted for the SUTA. Our experimental design was that we conducted all these possible rotations of this octahedron and selected 10 rotations with the maximum dispersion, 10 rotations with the minimum uh, dispersion, and compared the results obtained from each model with the benchmarks obtained using the LHS model. If you are interested uh, in the appendices, I have the procedure of obtaining these benchmarks. I can show those later. And in all models, we analyzed the yield uncertainty. Now let's look at the results obtained from the uh, ESIM model. So on the left side, we see the results uh, of uh, uh, different uh, of three different variables uh, uh, as uh, per, as percentage deviations from the benchmarks obtained using these Gauss quadratures with the maximum dispersion. And on the right side, we see the same results obtained using the Gauss quadratures with minimum dispersion. And the overall quality of uh, each Gauss quadrature is uh, evaluated using the mean squared arrows. As we see, uh, the, uh, the, these percentage deviations uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the group of results obtained with max, uh, Gauss quadratures with maximum dispersion for barley range from minus 4 to 2%, for rapeseed from 0 to 1.5%, and for wheat from minus 3 to 3%. Whereas in the, uh, uh, the, the these uh, deviations, uh, the same results obtained with the Gauss quadratures with a minimal dispersion for barley range from minus 9% to 13%, for rates it from minus 2% to about 3%, and for wheat from minus 8.6% to 2.6%. Also, looking at the mean, square, uh, mean squared errors of these uh, deviations, uh, we, see, uh, we see that uh, the mean squared errors uh, are much lower in the group of the results obtained by the maximum uh, Gauss quadratures with maximum dispersion than in the ones with the minimal dispersion. And this horizontal orange line is the average of the MSCs. And in the group uh, of the, um, in this maximal group, this uh, average is equal to 4.8 percent, whereas in the group with this minimal dispersion, it is equal to 23.5 percent. We see similar results in the global model. And uh, also in the recursive dynamic if the model. Uh, and the problem with this model, uh, the, the, these deviations are so high because this was a recursive dynamic model and the errors were accumulating over time. Now, uh, the, the method we have developed here, of course, I forgot to say that we now call IRGQ method because this is informed rotations of Gauss quadratures. Now, instead of randomly selecting these two rotations, we know which rotations produce good results. However, this uh, method has several limitations. First of all, this method, as Gauss quadratures method, does not capture the extreme tails of the distribution. This, of course, can be viewed as a disadvantage if, uh, if the researcher is interested specifically in the extremes of uh, extreme events, for example, or extremes in studies regarding the insurance and so on. In this case, we should suggest implementing on the top of the proposed IRGQ method, uh, the method proposed by Prekaletal, which was the, uh, uh, which allows broadening the sampling interval. 
by a desired factor. However, from the other side, this is an advantage because many of our models are simply not able to handle, lar handle large shocks and we simply end up with inf infeasibilities. And in this case, when using these Monte Carlo methods, what we usually do, we take the distribution and truncate the tails, which can yield to inaccurate estimation of the central moments of our results. Therefore, here, uh, this method has an advantage because it estimates the central moments of the distribution without taking into consideration these extreme shocks. And uh, the other restriction or the limitation of this method is that it is restricted to approximating symmetric distributions only. However, the central idea developed here can be applied to any other Gauss quadratures that may be depict asymmetric distributions. Now, future research agenda might uh, uh, include uh, testing the proposed approaches of widening the sampling interval by integrating this method with the method developed by Pekin and Chow, uh, and extending the methods to depict asymmetric distributions. Another uh, aspect can be exploring other factors influencing the quality of the you know, Gauss quadrature method. Of um, Sorry, two minutes warning. Yeah, this is the last slide, thank you. Uh, and of course, when uh, in practical applications, uh, we suggest first reducing the dimensionality of the problem, then applying this method for uh, uncertainty analysis, because not all variables, all parameters are equally important in terms of their impact on the uncertainty of the results. So we suggest first uh, identifying the most important parameters, then applying the method in order to reduce the computational requirements. And of course, we encourage testing and, uh, and applying the proposed methods in other simulation models addressing policy relevant questions. And for this, we have made publicly available uh, uh, an LP model, which given the, the covariance matrix and the factor of the base values will generate IRGQ points for you. Now, this uh, uh, LP model is developed in Wolfram Mathematica and R. So if anyone is interested, uh, you can simply send me an email. I will forward with the model. Yes, thank you very much. And this was it. Questions are very welcome. Okay, thank you, uh, David. I don't know if there are uh, questions from the listeners. You can, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, thank you so much for this great presentation, David. Um, it's uh, it's a very interesting and useful work. And I was wondering, you mentioned that um, you've tried this uh, with um, several partial equilibrium models and the, um, a dynamic CG model. Have you also thought about using it with the GTAP model? Is it applicable to that too? It is applicable because the GQ method is so after Channing Gard introduced this, GQ became the standard method of systematic sensitivity analysis in the GTAP model. But I myself have not tried in the GTAP model because I'm not a GTAP user. But anyone wanting to try is welcome. So uh, who wants to try it just basically needs to take this LP model that we have developed, generate these points and exogenously shock the parameter or variable who wants to make a systematic sensitivity analysis to. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Um, okay, now maybe I have one myself because I saw in the slides that you are using a dynamic CG models. Mm -hmm. uh, my, in, the, in, this, in this CG model, there is, uh, so, um, the, what is the time horizon? I mean, the temporal dimension is important uh, because I, I guess that the other models, uh, partial equilibrium models, they are static or, or I don't know. If you can elaborate a little more on this. Yes, thank you. So uh, basically, Globiome is also a dynamic model, but I used it only for one time step because generating uh, this baseline was, uh, not the baseline, but the benchmark using this probabilistic method was very heavy. Maybe I can quickly show this, how, how these benchmarks were generated. So for example, for the Globiome model, 
we start solving the same model with, for example, 500 uh, iterations or 500 uh, uh, sample size, and gradually increase the sample size. Then we compare the results, the same results, for example, production prices or quantity, uh, with the same results obtained from the previous sample size. And we say that we obtain a convergence whenever this uh, these deviations uh, stay within minus one plus one interval. And this is the case for uh, this uh, dynamic CG model, for example. As you can see, when we use very small uh, uh, sample size, 500, these deviations are quite high, and only at 14,000, for example, in the, the case of dynamic CG, I risk convergence. So the dynamic CG model was in the time horizon of this dynamic CG was until 2050. However, uh, because of the computational restrictions, I was not able to obtain uh, benchmark up to 2050. That's why I reduced the time horizon until 2025 to obtain this reliable benchmark. And uh, uh, yes, just for technical, reason, uh, technical reasons, uh, just for testing this method, it was fine to do so. so I also ran the model with, uh, until 2050 using this Gauss quadrature points, but I was not able to do the same with that this Latin hypercube sampling method was the probabilistic method. Uh, yeah, so I reduced it until 2025. Globium is also a recursive dynamic model, uh, but I only solved it for one time step again, because solving it 10,000 times required two weeks uh, of the model running on the computational server. And it's not that I'm running it only for two weeks, for example, because only this 10,000 takes two weeks. This 8,000 maybe takes another 12 days, the 6,000 takes another 10 days, and so on, until to reach the convergence. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Otherwise, we can move uh, to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Love it. And uh, the next speaker is Elisa Bardazzi from uh, Ca' Foscari University in Italy, and she will present a work titled Introducing the Water Energy Link in a General Equilibrium Model, ISIS WN. So the floor is yours, Elisa. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, um, I guess. Um, okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you uh, my findings about the introduction of the water energy link in a general equilibrium model. Uh, this work was developed for my part of my PhD thesis in partnership with the CMCC Foundation uh, that is presiding the the basis of the CG model, which goes by the name of ISIS. Um, so uh, mainly this, uh, this project stems from uh, uh, a, previ a previous uh, inquiry, uh, that is a systematic literature review that I did a couple of years ago, uh, in which I analyzed uh, um, how the uh, water energy food nexus was integrated in computable generable equilibrium. As, uh, uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, especially in the right part of the slide, uh, not many models implemented explicitly the necessary elements for nexus evaluation, meaning that they only focused uh, uh, specifically on, uh, mostly on the water crop uh, uh, relationship. So you see this, uh, um, the, the most of the of the CG was was only equipped uh, to to deal with this specific piece of the water energy nexus. So my main aim was to uh, fit, try at least try my best to fill this gap in the CG literature, uh, adding this uh, uh, this uh, water energy link that was the piece that was generally overlooked. So um, uh, to do this, uh, I, I took the um, GitHub-based model of my research center, CMCC, and um, 
and I parallelly worked on uh, uh, the implementation of uh, an economic value for water relative to the energy sector and uh, uh, the modification of the production function in order to conceive the new endowment that is water uh, that was not present before. So, um, well, th this, um, this, method, this methodology was based on several papers. Mm -hmm. Some of the most important are reported in the bottom of the of this slide. So, um, so okay. So, uh, in the top part of the slide, you see the initial production function of uh, ISIS. As uh, as you can see, it has mainly one bifurcation. Uh, on one side, it um, separates intermediates uh, and. Uh, um, uh, let's say foreign foreign and domestic uh, goods and on the other side uh, it deals with uh, how the the endowments are um, are used to generate the products of the specific sectors as you can see in the beginning it was uh, the endowments were exchanged uh, were described by a, a ces function uh, with sector specific elasticity uh, so uh, in practice uh, the exchange elasticity between for example uh, land and capital or labor and capital are exactly the same but they vary uh, depending on the type of uh, sector so for example you see that uh, agriculture has a 0 0.2 uh, elasticity industries has a 1.1 elasticity etc cetera, etc cetera, for all the uh, for all the sectors um so the, the main uh, the first step in our in our trials was to just add uh, uh, just add, just add water in the pre-existing structure, uh, so maintaining the CS uh, uh, specification. Uh, nevertheless, we looking at the literature and actually also thinking about the engineering structure of the energy sector. Uh, we thought that Aleontief uh, would um, could be more uh, more realistic in uh, in the way it deals with water and production. So implementing a slightly different uh, uh, production function, that is the one reported on the right side of the slide, where uh, uh, mainly water is exchanged, uh, um, is connected to the other endowments with Aleontief, meaning that it practically can be exchanged, but uh, the, the lower structure remains uh, uh, the one it was before. So we didn't make any, uh, we changed, didn't change any assumption for the rest of the endowments. Um, so, uh, then there was the process of uh, uh, assigning the economic value to the endowment for the energy sector, because uh, we, had, uh, we had some economic values for the irrigated agriculture sector that comes from GTAPW, GTAPW Bio, uh, etc. But there was no, uh, no value for the, for the energy sector. So um, to do this, uh, we, we took the, actually the, the value of the endowment for the irrigated sector and we divided it by the number of cubic meters used from this sector. Uh, in this way, we, we, we extracted this value for one cubic meter uh, that was specific for every region. And uh, this, this is very important because then we, uh, we simply multiply, let's say, simply multiply the the value for the number of cubic meters used by the energy sector reported by the statistics of the International Energy Agency, and this gives uh, the, the value of, uh, of the endowment in that region. We assumed, so let's say, uh, simplifying the issue, we assumed the same price uh, for, uh, uh, for the two sectors uh, and uh, so make, making the assumption that uh, the, the region uh, applies. Uh, more or less the same extraction technologies, they are uh, subjected to the, to the same sources and the same risk of exhaustion and uh, let's say extreme events if we consider climate change. So we, uh, regional, there are a, a sequence of variables that are the same. So we assume that the price and the risks associated will be the same and uh, we assume the same value. Uh, so after, after uh, extracting the, the values, so practically the, the basic one, the market value is VFM, and then there are uh, the other two uh, endowment-related uh, dimensions in GTAP, 
det tar uh, based on VFM plus uh, some taxation specifically uh, the household tax and the uh, uh, firm endowment uh, tax and uh, we maintained the same uh, the same tax rate as in the for, let's say we assume that for the same endowment uh, still we have uh, the same taxation so the, the, tax, the tax rate for irrigation and energy is uh, exactly the same uh, still for this uh, risk evaluation sources uh, assumption so um then we assumed the, the based on still based on the literature uh, we assumed that the uh, this value that we are uh, computing was actually masked in the value uh, addressed in, with the capital endowment uh, so mostly we, we assumed that uh, there was an overestimation of uh, the capital value because water the the, the, the value attributed to water was uh, uh, wrongly attributed to capital so we extracted this value uh, from the capital value. And uh, here you can see actually uh, there is an important issue. If you see the share that we extracted from the value of capital that is in, at the top right of the slide, you see that there are uh, the, the share are differentiated uh, for the regions and there are some regions that have a higher share that is extracted and redirected to water. Uh, and others have uh, lower values. So uh, this is important because this for region will come in handy later. Uh, so so uh, after doing this modification, we wanted to systematically test uh, uh, what happened, uh, assuming a value uh, also for energy and introducing this uh, water energy link uh, that was not existing before. So we did uh, systematic water scarcity simulations from 10% to 50% um, with the different, all the different specifications. So we tested all the modifications we made. So uh, we tested the two production function, the two version of the database, and we uh, tried to vary the assumption on water mobility uh, in order to see how the model behaves. And uh, so we did uh, 12, uh, there are 12 different specifications for five water scenarios uh, that um, mainly means uh, 60 simulations. So, um, so this is, this is, um, these are the preliminary results um, uh, for, from my, from my, from the simulation we developed. And uh, as you see, so mainly on the uh, left side of the slide, there are the results with the, CES, the CES specification, let's say. And uh, uh, on the right part, there is the, uh, the main result, the, the impacts on the global GDP uh, with the Leon TFL, let's say. So, uh, and here there is the first important finding of this work. So uh, we actually saw this is the 50% uh, shock. Huh? So it's the biggest one, but uh, we saw that, uh, let's take the Leontief that is uh, easier to see. If we simulated the same water scarcity um, with, the, uh, with only one sector is actually the blue one. The difference is in the land mobility assumption, but it, we actually see that in, in the overall GDP uh, impact, it doesn't make a, a big difference. Um, so we see that we have a value for uh, one sector. Then if we implement two sectors, uh, but we put water as a sluggish, meaning it cannot be redistributed easily uh, between, uh, between sectors. So uh, in this scenario, two sectors suffer from, uh, from water scarcity instead of one. So of course they suffer uh, more economically. So the impact is higher, but uh, if, uh, if we change this sluggishness assumption, so we assume that uh, water can actually be e easily redirected uh, from uh, energy production to irrigation and the other way around, you see that the, um, the result is this one. So it's lower not only uh, of um, these two sector with the sluggishness uh, that makes sense, but also, uh, but also respect to the one uh, sector scenario. So let's say uh, competition, uh, and redistribution of this endowment uh, 
makes uh, uh, ma makes uh, the the model to perceive uh, some uh, efficient solution that were in, uh, that, that, that are actually even more efficient than before. So. Um, Yes, so, uh, well, uh, but then we, we had to, we wanted to focus only on one specification for simplicity. So we assumed, uh, of course, uh, uh, water as mobile because uh, uh, we wanted mainly to, to study what happened with this uh, water competition, how water is redistributed, uh, well, which sector has the priority in a water scarce uh, scenario. And also we assumed, uh, Land, mobi land mobility. Uh, so actually, we changed. So the 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 usually the assumption in the in the literature is that uh, land cannot be redistributed between rain-fed agriculture and irrigated agriculture. Uh, so it's sluggish. Uh, why uh, is it that? Of course, because uh, uh, it's not that easy to pass from uh, uh, a land that is rain-fed to an um, irrigated. Uh, uh, land since there is a technological implementation needed. Uh, although uh, in this uh, specific scenario, uh, we are we are actually testing um, a shock that is uh, uh, supposed to uh, incentivize the other the other uh, way around. So to move from uh, irrigated agriculture water that uh, now is more costly because of water scarcity. Uh, to rainfed, and there's actually no real reason to assume that that couldn't be couldn't happen easily. And uh, also, we see that uh, in terms of uh, uh, so we see that the main impact of uh, the land assumption uh, relieve a little bit of the pressure in uh, uh, the increase in, of the prices of irrigated agriculture, but it doesn't have uh, that much of an impact uh, in the in the other prices or in the output of the uh, Rainfed agriculture. So we decided it was safe to assume that in this case uh, we could keep uh, uh, land mobile. So okay. So this, um, like moving on to the to the actual results uh, uh, regionally uh, distributed, uh, you see that. Uh, so what happens uh, in these slides? I'm showing the uh, impact on the output production of the two important sector in our simulation. So irrigated agriculture and uh, energy. So these are the green ones uh, are the simulation when the database uh, in, uh, implement water only for irrigated agriculture. The yellow simulations uh, is the two sector database, uh, let's say. So on the left, uh, the production function is assumed to be the CES. On the right, uh, is uh, is the Leon Kf specification. So what happens? Uh, well, what's the difference between the between all these um, simulations? Well, uh, as you see, uh, mainly so in the in the um, in the green specification, you see that uh, uh, irrigated agriculture, if uh, affected uh, by water scarcity, of course, is producing uh, less. Uh, because there's, there's water scarcity, there is a, a less endowment that is needed for production, so I produce less. And this is actually uh, mostly confirmed when I put another uh, when I put another sector using water. Um, well, ex except for a couple of regions, uh, a couple of regions, and we will see why. And um, but uh, for uh, for what concerns energy, actually. The, there is not uh, this uh, um, this clear trend, uh, but uh, uh, so we see that uh, uh, that there is a higher there is a higher uh, specialization regional specialization in production when um, there is the two sector specification. So when energy is depending from water, there is uh, a more distinct specification in energy production regionally. Um, what happens to prices? Uh, uh, well, you see that uh, um, in the one sector uh, specification, irrigated uh, agriculture prices uh, grow very steeply, and uh, in the two sectors is partially mitigated uh, for two reasons mainly. One is that uh, uh, 
there is more water in uh, in the model uh, and uh, um, they can be redistributed uh, so that there is physically more water because we 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 actually put uh, uh, the a uh, number of cubic meter available uh, in the model more and actually uh, as we will see before for most reasons uh, there is an there is a trend of uh, 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 translating water from energy to agriculture. So this helps in mitigating the, uh, the price increase uh, in the irrigated agricultural sector. Um, instead, well, this is, uh, let's say, pretty clear, uh, before the implementation of the dependence uh, of the energy sector from water, uh, we see that um, uh, energy was not affected, uh, so that the energy price actually goes down in the one sector specification because it's not dependent from water so it's actually uh, not affected but uh, the price uh, is increasing because it's driven from, from uh, endowment scarcity uh, when energy is dependent from water and uh, well this is pretty simple economic uh, uh, behavior so uh, well uh, so for concerning the the imports uh, um, so we see that there are uh, regions that are uh, in the, let's say yellow is the energy dependent from water uh, scenarios. Many regions actually uh, need a lot of, uh, of more imports on both the sector that are affected from water scarcity, especially uh, the difference is quite evident, uh, most in the Leontief specification, that is the right side, uh, instead of the chess, uh, because uh, uh, production is more constrained, uh, there is more specification, there, there is more uh, international specialization, so uh, these trends are uh, accentuated. Um, so what happens, uh, uh, looking at water, what happens in the model? Uh, well, uh, two, two minutes warning. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll go very, very fast. So what happens? Uh, well, uh, mainly you see that uh, uh, irrigated agriculture uh, asks for uh, less water, but more or less proportional to uh, both the shock in water scarcity and the decreasing in the output of this sector. Uh, ex with the exception of uh, OECD America that actually specialize in the production of irrigated agriculture uh, and, um, and increase a little bit uh, uh, the demand for the endowment. Uh, for energy, instead, uh, we see that, uh, uh, well, there is mostly a decline in the demand of water that is specifically accentuated in these three regions that, uh, uh, if you remind uh, from the beginning of the presentation, are actually the three main uh, water-intensive uh, uh, energy regions. So. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is not casual, this is, uh, it means that it's not efficient for them uh, to, to allocate water to this sector because it's very uh, water intensive. The, the main trend is that they will start to import from, uh, uh, let's say, less, less uh, water intensive uh, energy regions. So uh, to conclude, what happens here is that uh, if you see this is the before and after uh, percentage share of water allocated to, this, to, to the two sectors and uh, most of the uh, well most of the region increase uh, the water share uh, going to to energy so the yellow in the after part uh, is uh, bigger with the exception of the three uh, water intensive region that actually redirect so uh, makes a more uh, the share that um, is allocated to the irrigated agriculture that is actually the uh, the biggest share is more or less the the the, the amount of uh, water allocated to irrigated agriculture uh, statistically is 75 percent of the total uh, so that that's actually accentuated when there is water scarcity uh, meaning that there could be the, the there could be the creation of some uh, let's say uh, uh, like security issues in terms of uh, energy production. So there could be some hotspot uh, in which uh, uh, there is a um, production uh, issue uh, for energy. 
So I, I hope it was, I was very clear. If I was not, or you have some questions, you can ask me, ask them now. And, uh, or you can write to me as uh, this email. I will be glad to, to answer all your questions or uh, open a discussion on these themes. And, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess my time is over. I just want to, uh, uh, to show you like this is, this is a preliminary simulation on the 2050 uh, horizon and uh, assuming population and GDP growth uh, and you see that uh, mainly this was this is the difference uh, uh, before and after implementing the, um, the 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 water energy link and you see that uh, the mm, some specific regions are actually uh, achieving less of the expected GDP growth uh, because of the constraint uh, created by the water energy link uh, and uh, where mo mostly are the four uh, most water intensive uh, with the most water intensive energy sector. So this, uh, this actually uh, creates a policy, uh, policy say a policy concern uh, since uh, uh, of course they could um, they could have some uh, problems in, uh, in energy productions, uh, and especially if you consider uh, um, uh, transition to renewable energy that actually use uh, more, um, more water than the, than the fossil fuels uh, uh, for electricity at least. So th this is, uh, uh, it could be an issue and uh, we will investigate it uh, in the future. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, maybe we can uh, open the discussion. Any question? Uh, okay. So maybe even if uh, I am uh, <laughs> one of the codes or I can uh, ask a question. Uh, no, just because uh, this is just an introduction of the model, of course, uh, you mm, did some tests uh, and uh, some sensitivity analysis on the modeling, uh, let's say, specification. But uh, looking at the, at the application of this model, for example, uh, because, of course, uh, um, you, you work on climate, on, on an institution uh, which is our Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, so there will be application uh, on climate change, of course, but then I was thinking also to applications uh, um, uh, uh, related to mitigation policies, because uh, uh, in, in that sense, you really can capture the, the, the um, also, the, for example, the, the competition, uh, water competition between agriculture and energy because of the different uh, because of the different uh, mitigation patterns. And so for this reason, uh, it would be nice that the, the model, but you, you already know this, uh, would be, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, de further developed, uh, introducing emissions, uh, in introducing the climate module uh, for climate policies, uh, uh, basically, um, this, this is another step to, to, to do if you want to elaborate more on these applications uh, and the future development of the model. Okay, you, you... yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, well, the, the, the first step is to uh, let's say further disaggregate uh, the energy sector because uh, now it's uh, all together. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, especially working on uh, emissions uh, and uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, to climate change, uh, it's important uh, to uh, disaggregate in different, uh, uh, different type of energy since they have different coefficients of emission. So that for sure is the first step and uh, we are working on that. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the, the the idea is to see if uh, this, uh, so as this uh, last preliminary result I was showing, if uh, these uh, fact, this, the, this, these three uh, resources, let's call them resources, uh, so water, energy, and uh, land that reflects on food are actually three basic needs. So of course, uh, uh, if there is competition in their distribution and in the production of uh, um, basic needs, uh, uh, it's an issue of, of security and actually of sustainable development. 
so of course uh, the, the we need to see we need to uh, to evaluate uh, how much uh, uh, different type of growth uh, let's say more fossil fuel intensive or uh, uh, let's say different policies can trigger um some effects that we don't want for example let's say we we pass from uh Yes, of course, from fossil fuels uh, to renewables, uh, that is perfect in terms of emission, but uh, uh, they use more water, for example. So if we pass uh, to, I don't know, all nuclear uh, um, energy, that uh, actually there is a other environmental problem, but specifically referring to uh, water energy nexus, uh, it could be worse in terms of uh, constraint to so because if you remember yes of course there is climate change but if you talk about the limits of uh, the planet the planetary boundaries from Rockstorm etc and the Stockholm Resilience Center is not the only limit so that there is these issues that we need to carefully evaluate uh, if we are not overstepping in another uh, environmental problem uh, uh, trying to solve uh, the the question of climate change so that's that's for sure something uh, that that's what we will try to evaluate so what uh, our policy uh, that is able to mitigate or to adapt uh, somehow to climate change uh, but will not put unexpected pressures on the other limits and that that's the that's the main uh, aim of this uh, all this work so the the point is to have a global wider perception uh, of the problem Yes, and as you can say, as you have said, you can look also the issues related to food security and energy security, not introducing also this competition. I think it's important. Any other question? Please, Zeynep, thank you. Um, hi, Elisa, thank you for the great presentation. Um, the water, energy and uh, land link is very important. And um, I was wondering, could you clarify um, the land mobility assumption again? You mentioned that um, you assume land to be mobile, which is um, often assumed immobile um, or partially mobile. But uh, have you also um, do a sensitivity check on if you assumed land was immobile? Um, if I've missed that, I'm sorry. I just, I, 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 um, yeah, I wanted to. Uh, if you wanted to comment on it, thanks. Uh, yes, yes, no, for sure. I mean, uh, well, this is, this will be uh, actually translated in a paper. And if you look at the supplementary information, of course, uh, these 60 scenarios uh, are repeated for, uh, uh, let's say, all the assumption on both land and water mobility. It's just that, uh, well, when water is only in one sector, of course, there is no mobility between sector because there is only one. Uh, but yes, land is uh, replicated for both uh, mobile and uh, not mobile. And actually, uh, well, I, I wanted to reopen the, okay, the screen. Yes, if you see actually this, okay. Ah. Um, okay, this slide. Actually, uh, you see uh, here there is a, a slug and mobile. Uh, uh, assumption this is actually one, one of the tests uh, so here uh, land is uh, is actually sluggish is like the theoretical uh, uh, the, the the most common assumption so we we assume that land could not uh, be uh, redistributed uh, between the two sectors uh, that uh, that use land in our model so irrigated agriculture and rain fed but uh, yeah, and uh, then we tried to change it because we felt that in this specific uh, uh, simulation horizon, so uh, we are actually uh, making the price of irrigated agriculture higher because there is uh, an endowment that only this uh, sector uses it uh, that uh, is more scarce, so the price goes up. And uh, so the, the well, the, the main uh, the main uh, trend, the main shift uh, will happen from irrigated to rain fed, and that's actually not uh, uh, very difficult. Uh, the, the assumption on land mobility to be sluggish is because uh, to redirect it, uh, to redirect rain fed land uh, uh, to uh, irrigation is, is not supposed to be easy. So it's sluggish, it's not impossible, but it's sluggish because uh, usually you need uh, 
uh, technological implementation. So that's that's what uh, uh, what it is based on. But uh, we in this specific case we didn't feel it was important, and instead there was this. Uh, a uh, very big difference in uh, irrigated agriculture prices because if you see with the uh, uh, I, th I think this is uh, on the other way around but I, I mean uh, so it was uh, it was just uh, to to try to make a, a more reasonable per, uh, assumption on land uh, that for this specific uh, type of scenario of uh, simulation uh, we felt it was uh, uh, more realistic. That's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think if there are no other questions, we can move to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. The next is the next speaker is Bartolomei Rokiki from University of uh, Warsaw. And is going to present a work titled Incorporating Additional Information for the Estimation of Interregional Trade Flows. Thank you. The floor is, is yours. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can share the screen. Okay. Okay, can you can you see it? Yes. Okay, so um, this is a joint work with a colleague from University of Oviedo with Esteban Fernandez, and actually it's still a work in progress, so, so any comments uh, will be welcome. Um, the motivation of, of, our, of our study is pretty simple. So basically in the recent years, there's been a, a growing interest in, in modeling um, subnational economies, right, so regional economies, and, and the main problem to, to do that, either applying uh, input-output modeling or CG modeling, is that, that basically in most of the cases there is no regional data available, right? So we have a national input-output tables or, or supply and use tables, but such tables for, for particular regions are, are basically not are usually not available. There are some exceptions, obviously, but as I've seen most of the cases, um, there are no survey-based uh, tables ready for most of the countries, right? So uh, what is usually done, uh, well, non-survey methods are applied in order to regionalize those national tables. And, um, and basically the crucial the crucial step here, or crucial stage, is the, is the regionalization of the trade matrices. This is the most difficult and most controversial part of the, of the whole regionalization process. Um, so, um, yes, and there are several, at least several methods used in the, in the literature. So, um, vacation quotient based methods, um, RAS methods, or, or, or um, um, the most probably the most popular is the gravity equation based uh, methodologies. Um, but obviously, all all of those methods they have some uh, some deficiencies, right? So, so our motivation here is to is to present an alternative, uh, uh, a kind of uh, Bayesian technique that could be actually uh, used. As, as alternative to the existing methods. And to the best of our, our knowledge, uh, this, this methodology hasn't been, been used yet. Okay, so the method is basically called uh, generalized cross entropy. And, and as compared to the existing methodologies, it allows to deal with, uh, uh, with certain issues uh, present in, in, in existing methodologies. So for instance, uh, first of all, uh, it allows us to deal with the problem uh, of unknown totals or imperfect information about the totals of the, of the trade matrix. Uh, it also allows us to incorporate additional information um, if, we, if we have such, 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 such information that is not uh, included in, in existing methodologies. 
but also it allows us not to impose uh, certain arbitrarily uh, parameter values such such as for instance um, distance parameter in the gravity equation right so um, as we are, as we are saying we believe uh, that this this methodology could be could be could be pretty useful and what we show today what we want to show is that actually uh, this methodology may uh, provide more precise estimations that uh, that existing methodologies. Okay, so uh, so basically our problem is very very simple, right? So uh, the idea is that we we want to estimate the trade matrix, uh, regional interregional trade matrix, right? Uh, assuming that uh, both x and and y totals are are observable, right? And um, yes, and usually uh, it's it's assumed in the in the literature that the gravity equation and in, in particular the double constraint gravity equation uh, is is the technique that uh, that should be providing the most accurate results in this case, right? This this gravity equation is is, is pretty simple, right? So we basically take into account information or on, on origin and destination masses, right? We take into account that the that information on distance, usually between uh, regions capitals or, or the center of the regions. And finally, uh, yes, and there are some parameters that has to be has to be set, obviously, right? And in double constraint version, we also add the scaling parameters. Okay, so this is this is the as I'm saying the most uh, we could say the most accurate technique up to now in accordance to the existing literature. And now if we if we compare this technique with the with the entropy formulation, cross entropy formulations, basically cross entropy formulations technique, uh, the idea is to minimize uh, the divergence between the target matrix P and the prior matrix Q, right? So we want to estimate this matrix P uh, upon the prior matrix Q, upon some prior information that we that we have, and obviously this is subject to the uh, information observable observable information on vectors x and and y, right? So as I'm saying, this is our prior here, and this our solution must be consistent with this observable totals by columns and and rows. Um, and actually, I, I will I will show it uh, in in few minutes. If we assume that those totals right are actually perfectly specified, this technique cannot provide better results than the gravity equation based technique. Right. However, actually, it's very likely that we do not actually dispose of the perfect data on, on those totals X and Y, but only we have some kind of approximate figures, which actually uh, would be uh, estimated upon, upon this national uh, trade data, right? And in such a case, we may assume that there would be some kind of error, right? And in this case, uh, we may add this error to our entropy formulation, right? Uh, and this way we receive the, the specification for so-called data constraint uh, generate cross entropy. Okay, so, so this is the first modification. So that would be data constraint gross uh, uh, general cross entropy. And there is one more uh, variant, possible variant. It is, we may also have this additional information, which is actually not included in the gravity equation, for instance. So imagine that uh, apart from the information, row information on distance between the regional capitals or, or simply the, the center of, of each region, we may dispose on, of the information on, on accessibility, transport accessibility, right? So we may actually know exact um, I don't know travel time between between our particular parts of each region um, which actually may somehow aggregate to to get some kind of measure 
right, of, 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 of transport accessibility. Okay, and obviously this kind of measure, uh, it would not be included in the gravity uh, equation. However, uh, in the case of the cross entropy, we actually may add this additional information to our specification, right? How do we do that? Basically, we, we follow with the specification from the, from the previous um, uh, entropy uh, specification, which was a data constraint, but also we add here uh, this additional information, which basically means that our solution, our so final solution must be consistent, not only with those um, totals that we have, but also with this additional information uh, which is which is included in in, in this uh, parameter z, okay? And this specification would be called moment constraint uh, general cross entropy. So we have a uh, we have two kind of uh, of the of this general cross entropy formulations. One that includes possible error, and the second one which also includes this additional information. And and as I'm saying, this is work in progress. So. So for now, what we did basically, we, 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 we performed some kind of simple numerical simulation. So we estimated interregional trade matrices for, well, for random numbers, basically uh, 10, 20, and 50 regions. Um, and then basically we, we, we simulate uh, trade matrix, right? Um, assuming that initially our, our um, our methodology is based on on a, on a gravity equation, right? So basically, we assume that the trade is is a function of of, of some kind of uh, economic mass, distance, and this additional uh, uh, term here, which is basically a term that captures some kind of non gravity factors, okay, that may be actually existing. Okay, um, yes, for the sake of simplicity in the simulation, we, we set the parameters of the gravity function to, to, to one. Okay, and yes, and we also assume that actually uh, that there is a possibility of, of this error in the total, of original totals, right? So uh, it's possible that both row totals and, and column totals, actually they have some, uh, some error measured by the parameter sigma, okay? And basically we, we, we wanted to, to be pretty cautious, so we assume that the sigma parameter, this error actually will be very, very small, so we, we, we consider three scenarios, right? So we consider the scenario where actually our informational total is perfect, so the sigma parameter equals to zero, then the second scenario is that the error is equal to 5%, and the first scenario is that the error is equal to 10%. Okay, and then once we, once we uh, run the simulations, uh, after the simulations, we compare our free estimation techniques, so the gravity equation-based, data constraint, GCE, and the moment constraint, GCE, basically, um, using this uh, weighted absolute percentage, percentage error um, values. Okay, so we compare the simulated values and, and predictions produced by each, each technique. Um, and these are the results. Um, as I'm saying, uh, we haven't run many simulations. Actually, this number here, number 50, uh, can appear to be pretty small because if we assume that uh, we would have only five regions and, 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 and 20 sectors, it would be already much higher number than 50, but let's, let's, let's stick with that. Uh, what do we see if, if the error term is equal to zero? Basically, we see that the gravity equation or the estimates based on gravity equations are always better than the estimates based on, on this cross entropy um, uh, estimators. It doesn't really matter what, whether we apply data constraint or moment constraint, cross entropy estimation. If our totals are perfectly specified, then gravity equation is always doing better. 
However, what happens if, if those totals are not perfect? Uh, let's see what, what we have if the error is just 5%. You see, for 5% error, in all of the cases, moment constraint cross entropy formulation always perform better than the gravity equation, while the data constraints, so the, the formulation with, with no additional information, actually is doing worse in most of the cases for the 5% error. However, once we assume that this error is, is a little bit bigger, so 10% error, then both, both formulations, both uh, estimators, uh, data constraint and moment constraint, cross entropy estimate, they do already better than the gravity equation. And it doesn't really matter how many regions we, we, we take into account. In all of the cases, those estimators here are better. The more regions we have, actually, the difference between the gravity equation estimator and, and the cross entropy estimator is, is increasing, actually. Right, so so you may you may imagine in 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 more realistic case when we would have uh, many more cells to estimate, probably this difference is much much bigger. Okay, so um, these are our our uh, preliminary results, uh, which shows that actually uh, it's possible that this cross entropy estimator uh, may be doing better. Then the gravity equation, um, basically because uh, it allows us, first of all, to, um, to deal with some noisy totals, so with the errors, and second, because it allows to uh, include this additional information, which is not being included uh, in the gravity formula. Uh, what do we do, want to do right now? Basically, what we want to do is to... Uh, now to test this uh, this approach in in, 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 em in empirical em applications. So our idea is to use uh, the Korean uh, supply and use tables. This is one of the few countries where where the regional tables are available. Available. So basically, what we want to do is to is to take the uh, the national tables for Korea disaggregate them, uh, originalize them, applying those three methodologies and then compare with the uh, official uh, regional tables for Korea, which are, which are, are uh, survey-based, right? So that would allow us to actually to prove that, uh, that our um, conclusions based on these numerical simulations actually are also are valid in, in the case of empirical application. Uh, that's all for from me. Thank you very much uh, for for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, any question from the audience? Um, okay, maybe I have a question um, because uh, so the, because as you say at the end of the of the presentation, you are thinking to to pass from the I mean the, the ethical let's say uh, simulations uh, to the uh, an applied work uh, using the data of uh, Korea, yeah. and uh, mm, so I think that this 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 will be very very interesting. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. There are other countries where would it be possible to to, the, to do this kind of uh, of assessment because of data? Uh, we have data at the national level because I remember I presented in 2019 uh, in Warsaw, in Warsaw, but uh, a work where I compare uh, a methodology to regionalize the social accounting matrices. Um, and then uh, I compared this methodology with real data from Russia, but I <laughs> I had some critics because uh, maybe the data in Russia there were not so reliable for subnational regions. So I was just wondering if uh, other than Korea, which which is by the way a very interesting case study to test your methodology, there are other there are other countries where you can apply this uh, 
interesting methodology. Thank yes. You. Um, well, there is a there is a also um, one at least one possible uh, regionalized trade matrix for Finland, to, to to the best of my knowledge. But Finnish Finnish matrix is is a bit difficult in in the in the sense that. Uh, it's it's in Suomi, right? So it, it, it would take us time to translate it, and actually, it's 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 an old matrix. Uh, I think it's it's from the beginning of the century, so uh, it's twenty years old, more or less. They they did it just once, a survey, survey based, uh, yes, yeah, supply and use matrices for Finland. This is one thing. There is also for Japan. Uh, the problem with Japan is that I was investigated the Japanese regional matrices, and apparently, although the most of the of the regionalized uh, matrices are are, are survey based, actually the trade matrix is also gravity based estimated. So uh, it, it wouldn't make any sense for us, you know, to compare our results with with the estimation results, right? That's why we're looking for the, for a survey. And finally, obviously. The last possibility that we, you would have is to is to take the data for the entire European Union, right? Then the data for particular countries, and and disaggregate the first the data for the entire European Union, and then compare with the data for particular countries, treating the countries as regions, right? Of the of the European Union, that would be that that's another possibility. But as as I'm saying, that that wouldn't be subnational; it would be already. International, but yes, this is this is another possibility, and I'm not aware of more of more available sources to to do such a such an exercise. Actually, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, other questions? Please, thank you. Um, hi, Bart. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I was wondering about the uh, the the Korean. Um, uh supply into tables what would do you think would be your sample size and what is the dimensionality of it well you you mean the the, the disaggregation mm -hmm. well yes. like they have a data for regions korean regions i think 20 something regions so and it, it, it's a public data right so you can download this data from the korean statistical office basically Okay, but what is your sample size for for your analysis? It's so you gave um, n equals fifty uh, in your um, theoretical analysis. What is the empirical analysis sample size would be? As the sample size would increase, you would expect the, the it, it would be bigger. Uh, it would be bigger because you have to assume that you would have um, twenty something regions times the number of sectors, right? But but this is just a computation computational uh, problem, so it's it's not a big deal. I mean, this our, our, this approach should, should work for actually infinite number of regions or sectors whatsoever. So it's uh, I don't think it's a, it's it's a problem. It's just a more time you know for the computer to to give you the results. Okay, so I expect the cross entropy method to perform even better as sample size gets larger. That's yeah. That's that's what, what we believe. Yes, actually, that's what we believe. And actually, you know, the, the whole thing. What, what, why? Why actually we would we would uh, be interested in doing that is that uh, we, I had a recent paper when we are comparing different data sets uh, in terms of the simulation results. So we are comparing actually survey based database and and, uh, and uh, non survey based or 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 somehow like mechanically regionalized uh, database. And when we apply those two databases in the same model, exactly the same model, right? And, and what we found is actually uh, that the aggregated results are very, very similar, are almost the same, right? But when you get, if you're interested in sexual results and very disaggregated level or regional results by sector, then the results are becoming increasingly different. Right. So from this point of view, we believe that this this uh, this precision of the estimations of the trade matrix actually actually may be may be pretty important here. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. If you have time, maybe I have another question because I think uh, <laughs> this topic is interesting for me. 
and uh, now because I was thinking if uh, um, starting from the global from the global from the GitHub database, where for example, for, especially for developing countries where data are more difficult to recover, if it's possible to extend your uh, methodology. Uh, I don't know, combining, I don't, I don't know, location portions and this cross-entropy methodology to regionalize an entire social accounting metrics. But I'm just thinking aloud, I don't know, because, uh, because this mean, could it, be really a good, a good, uh, <laughs> good methodology. To I mean, this is, this, is, this is absolutely flexible, right? So the more information you have, the, more in, the, 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 the idea is the following, the more information available we have and we put into the entropy estimator, the more accurate estimates we should have, right? So, especially if you assume that uh, that this data, right, for the developing countries or, or or some other countries is not perfect, right? And actually, location quotients are 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 known to be not the best actually in in terms of the regionalization procedure, right? They are not doing very bad, very good, right? Uh, especially if compared with this with this uh, double constraint gravity equation right so if you assume that, that your current estimates are are not very adequate so i guess it 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 it, it would be worth to try this cross entropy definitely i think it would yes it, it could it, it could work better certainly better than the alky that's for sure but as I'm saying, we, we haven't run the you know the this empirical uh, estimation yet, so we, we, we can't assure 100 percent right that it, that is definitely better than the gravity equation. Although as I'm saying, those uh, simulations we did indicate that indeed uh, it may be more accurate. So as soon as soon as we as we as we make make this empirical example uh we'll, we'll be sure and and then we'll be able to you know to to provide the methodology basically for for other countries and and, and other databases as well that's for sure thank you uh, other question Okay, maybe if there are no other questions, we can move on to the next speaker with uh, Elliot uh, De La Hay. I, I hope I have pronounced well the name, uh, from the Department for International Trade, and uh, is going to present uh, um, this, uh, this work titled, How Strong is the UK's Preference for More Variety? So, Elliot, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me correctly? Okay, let me just share my PowerPoint. Can everyone see that? I'm going to assume so. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming along uh, to, to hear this talk uh, and uh, just say really interesting presentations from the, the previous few speakers. Really enjoyed this. Um, the, the topic of, the, of research that me and a number of my colleagues at the UK Department for International Trade we're looking at is estimating and refining a number of the parameters that we use in our CG simulations. So, as you might expect, as a policymaking institution, we're interested in how uh, changes in tariffs and non tariff barriers uh, affect it. In particular, we're looking at how those, those simulations that we run are affected by the, by the size of the parameters that we estimate for trade. Um, a quick disclaimer just before I, I start, um, just to note that the usual caveats apply uh, as with all policy research. This doesn't necessarily reflect the views of the UK Department for International Trade. Uh, it's just a piece of research by a number of our employees. So, um, to, to, as a as way of introduction, a bit of discussion of the context that we work in. 
um, as as we all know at the GTAP conference, uh, CG is a, a very important tool for this kind of trade policy analysis. Um, much of the CG work in, in the policy space relies on the standard Armington CG framework. This is something that is very useful because it's uh, very, uh, very recognized and, and uh, accepted framework. But considering the innovations that have occurred in, in the last uh, 40 years in the trade theory space, notably new trade theory um, from the, the famous work by Paul Krugman, um, we're, we're interested in seeing how more of the new trade theory can be brought into applied work in, in, trade, in, pol in trade policy uh, evaluation. And there naturally, of course, there, there is work going on here, but one of the key features uh, that might be noticed in a lot of policy work is that um, it, it tends to stick to the Arm Armington. Our feeling around this is that often the reason why uh, there can be reluctance to move to the more advanced uh, and perhaps more theoretically complex types of model structures is the, the lack of empirical evidence that exists on the key parameters of the new, the, the new trade um, theory structures. Um, there are many uh, papers out there which provide country by country estimates and they often differ in the values they have. And so one of the things that we're, we're key to, keen to look at, and we, we did with this research, is looking at exactly how um, these estimates uh, differ, depending on uh, two factors. One, for the country. Uh, naturally, we're, we're interested in the UK context. Um, but secondly, a factor in particular of relevance to anyone interested in expanding uh, use of new trade theory in within the GTAP model is what level of aggregation do these parameters need to be estimated at? Often previous uh, pieces of research have looked at estimating it at the product level, the HS product level or, or below. Um, and we're interested in seeing how sensitive are results depending on the, the level of, of aggregation. So uh, a bit of a whistle stop tour of the, the theory or the literature in this in the theory area. Um, people will, will be very familiar with this, but useful to just recap. Um, the whole area of new trade theory uh, really began with, uh, an, uh, with paper not relevant to trade in particular, but classic uh, paper on monopolistic competition by Dixit and Stiglitz, 77. Um, what Dixit and Stiglitz insights were, were that um, often consumers uh, had slightly differentiated preferences across a range of products within one market. And this gave uh, firms in that market the ability, a slight degree of monopoly power, and the ability to mark up prices above their marginal cost. Uh, meaning that, uh, first of all, there's not the same welfare implications in terms of competitive economics, but also um, meaning that in the long run, profits are still zero in equilibrium. Um, this, this assumption comes from a number of key factors, such as increasing returns to scale, um, and essentially the assumption within the consumer's uh, utility function that not uh, that each different type of product, that's to say the within a market, the different firms products are slightly differentiated uh, and hence not perfectly substitutable. Um, this was then picked up and, and developed in the trade space by Paul Krugman's famous 1980 paper on, on which established the, the area of new trade theory. And essentially what, what Krugman is looking at is the fact that with, uh, with a, a large number of national origin products um, that consumers face, this, they may have different preferences across this. So they might have different preferences for German cars over French cars um, and especially over domestic cars. Um, this means that each of these producers 
um, of, of cars have a degree of monopoly power, but as we note, um, key imp implication for this is it, it explains what had up until that point been uh, quite a puzzle in the internet, in the empirical trade literature as to why countries which they themselves are very good at producing particular products, as I say, like cars, why do they, why is it still observed that they import from abroad? Um, something which was much harder to explain under the previous uh, Ricardian framework. Um, and sort of just sort of refining this as uh, the implication of, of this in terms of welfare is that as countries move towards free trade, they'll shift if they if if it is in, indeed the case that consumers have a love of variety. That's to say, it is non-substitutable, as um, theorised by Dixit and Stiglitz. Um, this means that in situations where countries move towards uh, freer trade more liberal trade, um, they'll move away from their autarky basket of goods and uh, choose a greater variety of products. Now, as uh, I just suggested, this is quite key on that love of variety, and this is summarised in the substitute CES substitutability parameter um, here uh, using Sigma. Um, so as I alluded to at the beginning, one whilst the, the theory is strong in this area, the uh, the take up in the applied space has been uh, le less less um, enthusiastic, particularly in in policy spaces. Um, there are perhaps four key uh, papers. Um, there are sort of more minor papers which sort of develop uh, areas of here, but uh, in terms of the landmark papers. Uh, Feenstra's 19, 1994 study was very important. They, um, he estimates it uh, product level uh, or uh, six different manufacturing products um, using structural uh, uh, econometric identification method. Um, a key factor in it, it was the, the assumptions and how you construct price indices. Uh, this was then a, a very different approach taken by, by Hummels in 1999, and many uh, people on the call will be familiar with, with these. These are based on the gravity approach. Um, so one of the many wonders of the gravity equation is consistent with a large plethora of micro foundations, one of which is Krugman-style new trade theory micro foundations meaning that uh, the parameter on a variable like tariffs has the theoretical interpretation of, a, of the love of variety parameter. Um, again, estimating these for a, a range of uh, products. Um, but this, this was then superseded by the sort of a very prominent paper by Broder and Weinstein, 2006, who, who went back to the Feenstra method of a more structural econometric a, uh, approach, uh, again, taking it at product levels, um, but f confirming this finding that very uh, similar to Hummel's, that aggregation was a key factor in the, in the determination of parameter sizes and uh, lo uh, parameters, the love of variety uh, parameters are often higher at the lower levels of disaggregation. This is really key for our, our sort of interest in how they should be estimated for simulation at a GTAP level. Um, the, the last key paper is the work of, of Soderbury, and very much we, we sort of build on uh, the approach laid out by Soderbury. But um, what he does is take uh, eight digit product levels. Um, uh, Builds on the both the, the methodology of Broden Weinstein and Feenstra, and essentially brings together the micro foundations uh, a lot a lot more clearly, and uh, runs a Monte Carlo simulation uh, to establish what econometric methodology uh, in terms of the actual estimator is uh, best in terms of reducing sample, because uh, as with lot trade data. There's a sense of selection bias. Um, 
across all of these, a variety of different levels of the uh, the parameter estimates. But uh, the key finding of Sodebury was that by using the limited information maximum likelihood estimator, um, the parameter estimates uh, tend to be much lower on average than previously estimated in the literature. So focusing this towards uh, exactly what we've looked at, um, we, take this, we take the same econometric approach that Broden Weinstein, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, Sodbury laid out. Um, and as uh, sort of highlighted, what Sodbury uh, lays out is the full micro foundations of, of the approach, essentially sol solving the consumer problem, um, using Dixit Stiglitz preferences across the range of goods, uh, uh, which were differentiated by their destination only, and assuming a, a certain behavior in terms of fixed uh, or increasing returns to scale on the supply side, um, you can solve for the, both the supply and demand functions of uh, imports and together and sort of plugging those in together you get the reduced form that you can see on my screen right here um a bit of sort of notation here what what y is uh, is essentially the different the the difference log of the price of imports um this uh, and squared I, I should say uh x1 here is the diff the differentiated log of the quantity of of uh, of imports, um, x two is the the product of the differentiated log of the quantity and the differentiated log price, um, and then in the error term we have a, a, a nut is dependent on number of parameters. What the the, the key um, in one of the key insights of Sodbury in drawing uh, together the above um, the above work by by Lima, Feenstra, and Broden and Weinstein, is to to sort of lay out this theoretical approach, um, which can then be estimated in two stages. The first stage essentially um, is you 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 run regressions for x1 and x2 here um, with the the only right hand side variables being origin fixed effects. This, this essentially draws out the average uh, quantity exported by, by each uh, uh, origin country, and it gets the average value of each origin country. This is then, this removes the, the sort of the, the demand side um, uh, information from, from each of those variables allows you to then insert in the second stage regression of, of uh, that reduced form uh, to get the parameters theta one and theta two. Um, I should say that second stage relies on the limited information maximum likelihood estimator laid out by Sodbury in, in 20, his 2015 paper. Um, and in essence, uh, the key here is to constrain the, the estimates that are possible to to lay it out um, and ensure that they they meet with theoretical priors. The the data is one of the things that we spent the most time on, and it, it's it's quite key for invest our, our interest in investigating the difference between product level estimation and estimation on the GTAP level. Um, for product level, we use uh, CN8 data, but conscious that um, that eight-digit products often change between years. The approach we took to ensure that we get consistent quantities across the, the time period we look at, which is, I, I believe, if uh, not only I've not written it down here, I think 2008 to 2015. Um, our approach is to essentially aggregate the CN8 trade data into networks which link together in different years, but essentially allows us to have each product network on a consistent basis across the time period of interest and allows us to, to uh, run our regressions on it. Um, the trade and the, the trade value and quantity dates that we aggregate 
we then divide the values by their quantities to get unit value indices um, for each of these, but hence getting prices. The, uh, that, that's very simple on the product level, but on the, the DTAP sector level data, we uh, realized it's a much more complex area. And so you'll see in a moment, we run a few different sensitivities on exactly how we estimate these. Um, essentially, the, the, the key is because we the variables of interest we need are, are price, quantity, and value, is the, the hardest part of it is getting price states at that GTAP level. Um, the, obviously, what's required is the construction of price indices that reflect the prices at the network level. But this exposes one of the, the key difficulties we, we found, which is involved in GTAP level aggregation. And that's the fact that there's a lot of missing data. At the product level, this is uh, or the, the, the this missing data comes from the 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 ultimate reliance on unit value indices as the elementary uh, price observation. But the the issue is whilst in the when we run our product level regressions uh we follow sodbury and simply drop observations where quantities are zero because you can't estimate prices um when quantities are zero you get infinite values but this isn't viable when you're constructing price indices because obviously they have to be consistent over the the un underlying elementary value indices have to be um have to be uh consistent over time to ensure that the variation you observe is just the price variation so we our solution to this when various countries don't sell a product in in all years or don't sell it in or, or at all across the time period is to impute the data in a similar fashion to how many statistical agencies build their uh, price indices for products uh, which uh, are inconsistent over time. Um, this, this is where a lot of the debate comes in terms of how uh, we wrestled with exactly how to construct the, the, that in, imputation process, but um, we, we followed broadly the, the, this three-step process. First of all, we limited the number of countries in our sample, uh, in, that's to say origin countries. We're estimating this all for the UK using our, our, our national customs agency data. But in essence, we looked across a range of origins and to ensure that we weren't imputing too much for any particular country, we dropped uh, countries uh, missing a certain percentage of, of their price observations or quantity observations. After we selected the key, uh, the, the countries that we would include in each sector, we first of all rely on chaining uh, of prices across years. So this, the, in, in essence, this means that if a country uh, exports a product to Britain in some of the years, but not all of the years, we use the information within that uh, time series to impute the trade, the, the price of their goods uh, that is likely implied in that missing year, um, considering they will have had a price, even if the UK didn't purchase any of those goods in that year. But um, the countries which then don't have, which are still missing observations, that is to say they've never sold that product to the UK, we have to rely on information of uh, about similar products. Um, we first do this at the HS6 level, so that's to say if a particular CN8 product is not traded at all, we take the average um, of that product uh, at its HS6 level in each year. Um, we then, if they're still missing observations at HS4, and, uh, and then again uh, at HS2, we use the higher level aggregations until all observations are completed. We uh, to, to, sorry, two minutes reminder. Thank you very much. Um, that so so that's how we filled in our data, and then uh, as usual, we just deflate the total trade value in that area 
by the price index. Looking at results, we, we get a range of different values. Um, you'll, you'll see that uh, on, on average, our, our median estimates at the network level regressions are 18% lower than previous results uh, by Feenstra and Broden Weinstein. This corroborates um, Sodbury's findings. And you can see there in the histogram, the majority of our estimates are, are 1.5, 2, or 3, so very, uh, uh, very much on the lower end of the scale. Uh, suggesting uh, less love of variety. Uh, at the GTAP sector, I mentioned there are a few different ways we, we did it. But essentially, there was discussion of whether you, we could use, uh, whether we should include zero, zero trade flows or not, uh, given that we no longer had to based on unit values, uh, or whether we use an additional process of machine learning. What you will see is that across the different uh, approaches, the, the mean value of our estimates in, in this column uh, on, on the left uh, broadly doesn't change. But in the end, we decided that one of the most the robust estimates was uh, the, the sort of top approach, which includes zero in it and doesn't make the extra step of using a sort of machine learning technique to aid in the imputation. Um, comparing the results, we, we were very pleasantly surprised that the mean for the network and deep, uh, the network and sector levels are, are broadly similar. Um, but this summing it up and seeing exactly how important it is uh, to simulation, we we were uh, quite uh, sort of taken by just how important it is to estimate it. So. Running a, a very simple scenario here of uh, unilateral tariff reduction for the UK, um, we estimated uh, this on six different sets of parameters. On the left-hand side, we have our estimate estimated parameters where we take each different uh, elasticity estimated by each sector. The middle two pink estimates, they essentially take the average across all our sectors and use them both the network and GTAP sector levels. Uh, and then on the right, we use the previous estimates of uh, Roden, Weinstein, and Soderbury. I think two things we really concluded about the whole study is, first of all, you'll notice for the two sets of uh, estimates estimated at the GTAP level, welfare results are much, much higher. Uh, this emphasizes the importance of aggregation uh, that, we, that we spoke about, uh, which isn't massively sensitive to the different approaches, but also just noticing the difference between our estimates on the whole and Broder Weinstein's and Soderbury's, it shows just how important it is to tailor it to the, uh, to the particular economy of interest. Uh, thanks very much. Um, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, we can open the discussion. So questions are very welcome from the audience. Um, okay, so maybe I uh, <laughs> I will try to 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 ask a question. So if I have understood correctly, basically, the, um, given this, uh, this estimation, the welfare gain are underestimated, uh, basically, um, in the previous work because the elasticity of, uh, this elasticity of sub substitution between varieties uh, in, in, for a given sector is, uh, is lower than, uh, than, than expected. So basically, the basic mechanism for the welfare gain is that you can uh, basically give up domestic varieties and uh, have more varieties from uh, uh, from abroad. And in, in, in this way, you are able to to increase your welfare. So this is the the, the economic mechanism. If I have been, if I, ha I have understood correctly, so basically. Um, so what it, it would be interesting because th this is true for uh, for um, US uh, if I always if I have understood correctly and now you you have proved that this is the case also for UK so I, I I'm wondering if this can be applied to other European countries because uh, uh, to have additional uh, 
um, uh, additional uh, proofs of, of, of this. And if you have, I don't know if you you, are, you have you can apply easily this methodology to other European countries, or you have a limitation in the data uh, to recover the data needed for 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 the econometric analysis. Th thanks. That's a brilliant question. Absolutely, it can be applied, and and really one of our one of the key things we are interested in is not just taking the the sort of UK specific inference, but really seeing for for each different country as uh, sort of advice on how to estimate it or wh whether it's best to estimate it at the gtap sector level or at, at the product level um in terms of how easily it could be applied to new countries it actually uh, very easily one of the uh, sort of surprising things about the methodology that first of all feenstra developed but sort of developed up until Sodebury um in his paper is that the only data which is required is import data on trade values and uh, trade values and trade quantities. Everything is constructed from that. And so uh, it can easily be uh, got from each country's customs data. Eurostat obviously would be the obvious um, place for, for EU nations uh, trade data. But also if you were uh, sort of whilst it's best to estimate unit value indices uh, at the most disaggregated level possible. Um, if you're willing to risk some of these of issues known with higher level unit value indices, uh, you could absolutely just download the, the data from Comtrade at the HS6 level and, and apply it to, to any country in Comtrade. Interesting. Any other question? Please sign up. Thank you. Hi, Elliot. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I've been also working on estimating parameters for new nutrient models, firm heterogeneity models. And in those models, this, this um, elasticity values are tangled with uh, supply side effects, with the shape parameters. So I was. Uh, one of my questions is, are you also thinking about expanding this methodology to firm heterogeneity models? What could be um, the um, uh, the challenges there um, applying this model? Another question is, it's interesting to see that oh, whenever these um, uh, parameters are estimated uh, in alternative methods, we always see that these are um, lower. Uh, in these, you know, updated estimations with different techniques, and um, so, and for UK and US, you use the same industry aggregation, right, at the GTAP level. And if you were to estimate this for a more disaggregated level, you would probably get smaller elasticity values, indicating that these sectors are more, um, or at least the, the commodities are more differentiated. Um, as opposed to the, I don't know, the original or uh, the existing uh, values in the literature. Um, could you comment on that? <laughs> I, I, I was wondering about what you think about that. Thanks. Absolutely. So uh, taking out your first question about new new trade models, we're, we've certainly had um, quite some interest in uh, sort of the parameters of those sort of Mellet style models and uh, firm heterogeneity limit. We've not we've not yet sort of found the time to to do any econometrics and and investigate it for the data, but um, it you never know maybe it's something we'll we'll look at for, for the GTAL conference next year. Um, it's it's something we we I get again I think in the in the policy space there's been a, a hesitancy to to move move towards. So applications of the more more complex, advanced uh, styles of, of trade model, um, and so I think you know any further research there, you know, it'd be very interesting to hear what what you've been doing in that space. Um, I think that's sort of quite key to sort of reassuring um, the use of use of these models uh, for sort of policy analysis. Um, apologies, I've forgotten your second question. 
Um, it's about the desegregated, I mean, whenever we update these um, elasticity estimations, we always get lower uh, values and indicating that more the more differentiated commodities. I was wondering about what you think about that. Um, are we treating these commodities or sectors um, as more homogenous always? And does it make sense? Um, yeah. I, so I, I think that's a re really sort of good point. Um, and I think it reflects two things. Is one is a the just the importance of the of the estimation. Uh, there's a lot of research which is sort of tended, I think, to focus on the sort of much more classic Armington elasticities, which which focuses on you should estimate your your trade elasticities at the level of simulation. Um, that way. Uh, you won't get all the intra elasticities within products where they might substitute each other, um, given the sort of trade costs applied to one, not the other. Um, but I think it also reflects just the huge amount of uncertainty which is uh, which surrounds these really key parameters, which a lot of people take for granted. Often, um, you we we find a lot of sort of CG analyses take place. Uh, again, obviously, we're, we're in an area of, of scrutiny of policy making. And that means that uh, we, we ha we're keen to be any uncertainty, try and resolve it. Um, but a lot of uh, simulations you'll see from, I've, I don't know, international organizations or from other nations around the world, often don't discuss the values of their, their parameters. And so I, I think what it's, it's the, this sub tendency for the parameters to get lower and lower as each new piece of research comes out just sort of speaks to, to why it, it's so important for people to engage in, in this literature. Thank you, Elliot. I completely agree. And that's also a good link. It shows, I mean, your work shows the good link to modeling these sectors, right? Too. If the elasticities are lower, then treating it as perfect, the competitive, as non differentiated commodities would mislead the results like you showed in the welfare results. But um, it's to the point that before starting modeling, maybe we should do the econometric analysis and see what the data shows us and then start modeling the sector maybe even yeah thank you it, i i i think that's it's definitely something that uh, i and a number of colleagues have found is that often i think there's that there can there can be an easy habit that, that uh sometimes people sort of take out of the box models and uh don't which haven't been developed specifically let's say for the uk context and uh, and then used for simulations, not not uncritically, but without sort of really interrogating those parameters. I I I think I definitely agree. It's it's useful to um, have that sort of interrogation stage where you really sort of understand how applicable sort of out of the box parameters are uh, for for your particular question or your particular national context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? So, um, if there is no other question, uh, maybe we can. Uh, we can close here this uh, interesting session with very interesting uh, presentations, um, very different among them, but really very interesting. And I think also very useful for the development of our uh, modeling exercises. So um, let me, please help me in uh, thanking our presenters for their valuable and thought provoking presentation. And uh, I think that uh, we can close here the session. I thank you, everybody. Um, and that's it, I think. <laughs>
<laughs> I'd like to echo Gabriele. Thank you so much for the great presentations. And thank you, Gabriele, for um, chairing the session um, and all the questions. So, um, yeah, have a great rest of your day or night. <laughs>